All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Christopher Rocchio, the author of the Sun Eater Science Fantasy Series from Daw Books here in the U.S. and Golanx over in the U.K. And uh, we are here tonight to celebrate the release of uh, book three, Demon in White. Uh, hang on, I got my own voice playing in my ear. There we go. Hazards of live streaming. Um, and so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. I'm going to do a couple of short readings from it from early on, don't worry. And uh, then we'll do some Q&A, and I've got a surprise for everybody here at the end. Um, before we get too deep into, I want to say that this is the third book in the Sun Eater series, and it's hard to talk about a third book in a series, at least so i found so far, uh, without spoiling things from books one and two. So if you haven't read uh, Empire of Silence or Howling Dark, uh, it... Uh, it's kind of inevitable that we're going to talk a little bit about them. I'm going to do my best not to ruin everything, but even in reading the book a little bit, uh, something's going to come up. Uh, so for those of you who haven't gotten uh, to start it yet, uh, Demon in White here is set for Hadrian about 80 years after Howling Dark. I think it's been about 200 years standard because, of course, he spent some time frozen. So for those of you who found the... Uh, Time skip between one and two a little confusing. This one uh, has another time skip. Uh, I uh, hope it's not quite as disorienting, but Hadrian's not waking up from fugue at the beginning of this one. Uh, he has been working as an imperial knight. Uh, as you'll recall, the emperor went to knight him, uh, wanted to knight him at the end of uh, at the end of book two, and so he's been doing that. He has been uh, turned into basically the one thing he never wanted to be, one of the one things he never wanted to be, a soldier of the empire. But Hadrian being Hadrian, he is trying to do his level best uh, at that. And so I, uh, rather than ramble, think I will just go ahead and start reading. Uh, I'm going to do two shorter sections, and then we'll jump into questions at the end, and I'll hang out and do as many questions as you guys want. Um, so this is uh, right from the beginning. Both of the readings are from pretty early in the book because, again, I don't want to give too much of this one away. Um, so uh, Hadrian is having a meeting with the emperor. Uh, my friend Joe, who is the best man at my wedding, uh, demanded that I do a bit of this scene. So who am I to say no to Joe? Um, <clears throat> there are not many people in the galaxy who can claim they have visited the Paranine Palace. That palace within the greater palace of the eternal city where the royal family makes its home. There are even fewer who can claim to have visited more than once. On that second visit, the great doors swung open soundlessly and within the mechanisms of a great clock chimed. Upon crossing the threshold, the pace of the excubitors changed, flowing seamlessly from a brisk march to a slow and steady goose step. The ringing of their boots on the tile aligned with the ticking of the clock whose pendulum swung free and mighty above the pointed arches ahead. We came at last by many turnings to a water garden, whoops, a water garden built of the whitest marble. Bright fountains played on waters thick with pale lotus blossoms and the azure blooms of nenophars. Two women sat in one corner, softly plucking at harp strings while his radiance sat in a humble seat beside a small table. Four of his excubitors stood near at hand, watching me through mirrored masks. I bowed as my guard saluted, right hand over my heart, the left thrown wide. Your radiance, I said, I am honored to have been summoned. Caesar William rose from his seat, setting aside a small black book he'd been reading, and approached me with a jovial wave and a warm smile. Sir Hadrian, it is good to see you again. I looked down at my feet. I wanted to apologize, Radiance, for speaking out of turn at the soldier's audience earlier. It is forgotten already, cousin, please. Stand upright that we may see you. The emperor smiled as I stood and gestured to dismiss my escort. The excubitors retreated backward, folding away between painted columns, leaving me with the impression that they were not truly gone, but waiting invisibly among the pillars. We have not yet had occasion to thank you for your service at Aptica. That is two of these Cielsin princes you've put an end to now. Bowing my head, I said, Again, your radiance, you honor me. The honor is yours, the emperor waved one velvet-gloved hand, rings glittering, indicating that I should walk with him. Would that all our servants were so effective. 
I had no response to that and so said nothing, but walked in step with his radiance around the pools, our shadows leading the way. The emperor was taller than I, and though I knew him to be more than four times my hundred years, there was no silver in the red of his hair. But for the red velvet of his long gloves and slippers, his suit was of the most brilliant white silk, chased with gold. If I had felt underdressed outside the Sun King's court, I felt insignificant in Caesar's presence. His rings alone might have fetched the price of a planet, not for their gems or their craftsmanship. Such things could be manufactured cheaply enough, but for their age. I did not doubt that each of them had come out of old earth before the fall. They are singing your praises throughout the empire, you know, defeating the pale at Aptica without spilling a single drop of human blood. <clears throat> Would that it were so, I said soberly. The emperor stopped his steady pace. I could feel his eyes upon me burning a hole in my cheek. It is so. We have decreed it so, and you would do well to stand by the official tale. As you say, Radiance, I dared not turn and meet his gaze, risked only a sidelong glance. His imperial radiance, William the Twenty-Third, was frowning, a slight furrow slashed between his eyes. Then it was gone, expression returned to one of pharaonic calm. Recalling that expression makes me hesitate even to this day. Aptica was a stunning victory, but the lies the propagandists in the Ministry of Public Enlightenment piled atop the truth made it shine all the more. You're certain the prince is dead, Caesar asked, resuming his orbit of the pool. I glimpsed one of the excubitors between the pillars, watching through the hollow eyes of his mask. Quite certain, your radiance, I killed Ularani myself. His imperial radiance nodded, traced the line of his jaw with one velvet-wrapped finger. Something plainly was weighing on the imperial mind, and he walked on in silence a moment, passing delicate frescoes on the walls of the quadrangle, depicting fantastic tableaus of nymphs and angels. Tell me something, Hadrian, the emperor said. Something in his tone caught my attention, and I turned to look to, at him. Are you my man? He had abandoned the royal we, and in doing so revealed himself, though it is blasphemy for me to record these words, as only a man, and one exhausted by the crown and station he bore upon his too narrow shoulders. I did not know how to answer him. Your radiance? Enough of that. Answer me. Whom do you serve? He had seen that treason, had he seen that treasonous medallion Carax had tried to give me? Did he believe I plotted against his throne and family? I felt my knees begin to bend and cursed myself for it. To kneel would be to appear contrite and so guilty. So I did not kneel, though I sensed a great many things hung upon my answer, my life not least of all. I am a soldier of the empire. I said, what else could I say? I had not wanted to be, but few is the number who live the lives they wish for. His radiance huffed through his nose. The empire, very good. In that case, I have a job for you. His irritation fading to amusement, he turned his back on me and examined the nearest fresco. It depicted an icon of beauty rising from the sea, high-breasted and golden-haired. Have you heard about this business on Gadodin? Gadodin, I echoed, not sure I'd heard the name correctly. It was the first time in my life I'd heard that name. The name of the planet I would one day destroy. <clears throat> How insignificant it seemed to me in that moment. A meaningless word. A meaningless world. It's a primary legion base between the Sagittarius and Centaurus arms of the galaxy. We've been using it to stage trip deployments across Centaurus as the Cielsen advance. Intelligence dispatched a legion to Nemovand in Romanu province, but it never arrived. Something cold turned over in my stomach. Another lost legion? 
More than a dozen had vanished in the last century. Convoys hit while traveling at warp, the soldiers taken or slain in their icy sleep. I had been sent to locate the 378th Legion on Array decades earlier, and but for a few survivors, I had failed. The Cielsen. It had not been the Xenobites on Are, but the extrasolarians. Quite possibly, Romanu province is badly in need of supplies and reinforcements, and the loss of the caravan may cost them dearly. We do not wish to lose another province, cousin. We require that you make all possible speed for Gadodden, ascertain what has happened to our legion, and return them if possible. I felt the jaws of the trap close around me. It was an impossible task. On Are, at least, there had been a planet nearby, a place worth searching. Though our chances had been slim, we'd had a trail to follow. They may have been singing my praises throughout the Empire, but they sang too loudly. I had flown too close to the sun, and standing so near the Emperor, the firstborn son of Earth, that thought nearly brought a smile to my grim face. The sun, indeed. I was meant to fail, that I might return humbled and be made to abase myself before the solar throne, to crawl the length of that interminably long hall beneath the eyes and nervous laughter of the high lords and ladies of half a billion worlds. But something was missing. The emperor would not have called for a private audience to tell me what any of his servants and logothetes might have done. I looked again around the garden at the lotus blossoms and nenophars and the icon of beauty reclining upon her shell, at the excubitors and the eunuch functionaries lurking in the shadows, always waiting for the imperial order to approach and to be useful. I looked at the emperor again, and because it was expected of me, I said, as you command, honorable Caesar. And I will end that reading right there. I should mention as well, I know that this is a bit of a strange year. We can't do conventions. We can't do book signings. Uh, we can't really get out. And so it is, um, I, I've been trying to think of a way to get everyone uh, signed books if they want them. Uh, you'll notice in the description on this video, uh, my local bookstore, Quail Ridge Books, uh, is uh, making signed books available. They actually do this all the time. If you ever want to order a signed book, you can order them from Quail, Quail Ridge Books. And just note in the other comment section during checkout that you want it signed and how you want it signed. You know, to Steve, to Jennifer. Uh, you know, if you wanted to say happy birthday, if it's for a friend, that sort of thing. I've even been known to write the odd Black Sabbath lyric because uh, some of you may know I am a big fan. Um, and so uh, uh, you can check that out there. You can get Demon in White, Howling Dark, Empire of Silence. Uh, they've got all of them. I think they've got the UK editions as well. Uh, you can even get the uh, anthologies I've got. So if that's the sort of thing uh, you would like, uh, we are we're able to do that. They told me they've got about 40 pre-ordered already. So thank you if you've already done that. Uh, trying to beat the book two record, which I think was 45. So we'll see if we can get there. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read from a little bit further in. That was kind of a talky scene, and I wanted to do one that's got a little bit more going on. Uh, as you can tell, Hadrian goes to Gadodden, uh, the planet he has told us at the beginning of the first book. He is going to blow up. Uh, we're getting to it. Uh, and he gets there pretty early, and uh, he encounters some uh, some strange soldiers there. The Empire has recruited from some of the colony uh races, uh, alien species. Uh, and so he's encountered some uh, Urkatani, uh, who are the bird people that he always wanted to meet as a kid, the ones that Simeon the Red, if you remember that old story, uh, helped uh, defend from uh, being enslaved by some soldiers. Uh, so I'm going to read you a bit from that scene. All right. The southern spur of Fort Din stood farthest from the city, looking out upon the green sea and the ruddy buttes rising from it. The wind off the mountain smelled of rain and tugged at the dry branches of those few trees the legion permitted to grow within the fort. The barracks themselves were an ugly L-shaped building of steel and cement, whitewashed and flat-roofed, bristling with antennae and comms equipment. The yard between the two arms of that building had been rolled flat in construction and was barren but for the stray weeds. But there they were, drilling upon its surface. Despite my years, I have not grown used to the sight of xenobites. There is something of earth in our genes, I think, which tells us how life 
is meant to look. And when we encounter something otherworldly, the mind rebels, reacts with horror in much the same way as when confronted with something that is like humanity, but not nearly like enough. Man-like, but not man they were, and less than man-high. The tallest of them might just barely have looked down its nose at Lorian, who was hardly five feet tall. But they were as broad as men and rounder in the shoulder, so that they seemed to huddle and slouch as they went about their business. Each wore a dun uniform, cousin to the black fatigues of our own soldiers, and not at all unlike those worn by human auxiliaries though each had a deep pointed hood in lieu of the berets sometimes worn when the men were out of their armor. I stood at the edge of the yard, watching like a child as one of the Urtani spread out arms that were longer than it was tall, great pinions flexing, emerald feathers long as swords. Then it leaped skyward, wings kicking up a wind as it rose, and the noise of its cry split the air like a wedge as it chased after another of its fellows. As it drew near, it swung, and against the pale gray, so gray sky, I discerned the flash of steel. It has a sword, Polino said, voice strangely hushed. They fight with these cutlasses, I said, pointing. Tall as you or I, they call them Zitra. But where are their hands? Valka answered before I could, and I guessed those machine eyes of hers. It magnified her vision to give her a better look. Ever seen a pterosaur? A terra what? Middle of the wing, I said, cutting them both off, holding my own arm up for examination. I went on. The pinion folds out from the wrist like a second elbow. Hoy! came a deep-throated cry, and turning, I saw one of the creatures waddling towards us from the field, a wing raised in greeting. Its hood was up, but the beak protruded from it, black but red at the edges. <clears throat> A double gold chain looped across its chest, pinned to either shoulder, and I saw the familiar oak cluster gleaming at its throat to mark it as a killiarch. Here, then, was the captain of the entire auxilium, all thousand soldiers. Greeting, Sir Knight, and good day. The Uktani extended its wing in salute. Its beak did not move as it spoke, only opened. I was surprised at how well the creatures spoke our tongue. I knew next to nothing of the Urktani language, and I was struck also by how very like our tyrannic birds the creature was, and wondered what fluke of nature had made something so seemingly familiar beneath an alien sun. What brings you honoring us? What was I to say? I had had no plan save to see the creatures that had peopled my childhood stories with my own eyes. I had not thought much further. Grasping for words, I bowed. I only wanted to meet the Ishan Uktani for myself. I have never met one of your people before. I had seen one for a moment, a long time ago, aboard the Enigma of Hours. The day switch and I had been separated, and I had met the prophet, Jari. Sa shaking myself to rid my mind of thoughts of Jari, I said, I am Sir Hadrian Marlowe, Lord Commandant of the Red Company. As I spoke, two of the others came up behind their commander to listen, and the senior Zenobite replied, I am called Barda. I am Kithun, Kiliarch of these. The creature bowed awkwardly, and I guess the Zenobite's legs were not meant to bend as ours. I returned the gesture. You are the devil? Barda spoke haltingly, not confident of its own Galstani. Put that way, I had to stop myself from smiling. The devil indeed. A small knot of the creatures came up behind their kithun to see what was going on. I could not tell which of them was male or female, or what passed for male or female among the Urtani, who, like us and unlike the Umand of Imesh and the Sielsen, have two separate sexes. Some of them were unhooded, and without the garment in place, their heads looked oddly small, eyes dark and beady above hooked beaks. Forgive us for intruding. I'd only just heard your people were here and wanted to see you. See us? Asked another of the birds, a shorter, squatter one with grayer plumage who held a zitra in one scaled claw. This isn't a zoo, human. The swan's voice was deeper than Barda's and rasped like the voice of crows, but its Galstani was better. 
Show respect, Udax, Barda squawked and coughed the younger Xenobite before chirruping something in its native tongue. A mingling of quacked words and trilled music it was in my ears, and hearing that sound I smiled, wishing that I could play a flute as Simeon had done to learn the music of their words. Udax snapped its beak in reply. Raising my hands, I said, it's only that I grew up on stories of your people. When I was a boy, my father used to tell me tales of Simeon the Red and Prince Feda and the Battle of Athenvar. He talks to us of history, Udax sneered. We are not your storybooks, Unan. We are here now. We and we come to fight these pale worms of yours. The younger Urktani thumped its chest, talons flexing against the earth. We are the fighting Urktani. We are here to kill, not to amuse you. This, this set several of the others cawing along with it, wings flapping in agitation. Not knowing the Urktani well, I did not know how dangerous a sign this was. Unan, I thought. Worm. It was the same word the Urktani had used to speak of the Sielsen, but then I suppose that Neither their species nor ours could fly. Peace, man, Polino said. We're all soldiers here. Soldiers? One of the other young ones exclaimed. If we are all soldiers, why are we kept apart from your kind? Be quiet, Udax, Morag. Barda said, rounding on his subordinate. This is one of the Bashan Iseni. Bashan Iseni, I later learned was their word for palatine. Literally, it meant higher beings, gods. But Udax was not quiet. I am tired of these Unani gawking at us, Kitun Barda. Every day they are watching. We are not on display. The soldier shifted its long cutlass in its grips. We'll go, Valka said, tugging gently on my cape, then more softly, come on, Hadrian. But I did not understand how I had offended the young alien, and it felt wrong to leave without first trying to make matters right. Kithun Barda, I said, addressing the commander, I did not mean to offend your people. He does not speak. He does not even speak to us, Udax called, speaking up before Barda could reply. A chorus of alien noises rose to greet this pronouncement, birds talking over one another until I discerned the repeated word, Ida. Ida. I did not know its meaning then, but know it now. Get him. I did not see Udax's Zitra move. I heard it first and threw my arm across my face, pulling my cape with it. The armor weave embedded within the white-on-white -white brocade stopped the alien edge from cutting into me. But it did not stop the kick Udax threw at my chest. God, Emperor, the strength of it. I must have knocked Valka over as I flew backwards, skidding on the flat earth. Polino swore and leaped over me, but before he could strike Udax in the face, two more of the young Urktani's compatriots were on him. I was bleeding. The Xenobite's talons had sliced through jacket and tunic alike, and for a moment I feared the silver chain I wore to hold the shell the quiet had given me was broken. Udax pulsed its wings once, gray feathers kicking up a cloud of dust as I thumbed my shield and found my feet again. I was torn between casting my cape away for greater mobility and keeping it for the defense it offered. In the end, I chose defense. <clears throat> taking a bunch of the fabric in my left hand to ensure my arm was covered. Stand down, soldier, I said, pointing with a covered arm. You don't give me orders. It swung at me again, blade clipping off my arm as I raised it in a boxer's guard, fist to my temple to shield my head. I did not want to draw my sword. High matter was too dangerous. It would make short work of the alien's zitra, would cut common steel like paper. But I did not want to maim that wonderful creature who was, after all, fighting for humanity and the Empire. We did not have to fight. I glanced over my shoulder, saw one of the plainclothes men helping Valka back to her feet. Get her out of here, I shouted, turning back just in time to block another strike from that long and wicked blade. There was nothing for it. The Zitra was simply too long, and I didn't like my chances fighting the Urktani fist to claw in any case. 
Leaping back, I drew Sir Alloran's sword from its holster and activated it with a touch. Liquid metal condensed into a blade a meter long and shone bluer than the sky. I raised it in a flat parry that caught the Urtani's weapon as it plunged through an arc that would have split my head in two. I felt no resistance as my blade passed through the Citra, but the broken blade tore my cheek as it spun past and buried itself point first in the ground behind me. Bleeding now freely from cheek and chest, I pointed the gleaming blade at Udax and growled, Get on your knees. An alarm began to sound, the same brang voa voa that had played from speakers in the Bastille and Borisivo when I had fought and killed the cornered Uvanari. I hated that sound. There were too many ghosts in it. I kept my sword leveled at the Urktani. You've a fire in you, lad. I looked back toward the keep, saw military prefects hurrying towards us across the yard, distinguishable by their open-faced white helmets and the armor they had on over the uniforms, over their uniforms, even here on base. The sun, my sun, stood high in the sky above us, pale in imperial white. Watch it doesn't consume you. Udax's all-black eyes narrowed, and the feathers on its head stood up. I did not move, did not lower my blade, not until the prefects were upon us and forced Udax to lie face down on the dirt. No fitting place for a creature such as it. Only then did I stow my blade, the metal vanishing in air like the night fog beneath the first light of day. One of the prefects said something to me, but I did not hear him. There were more prefects swarming about us, forcing the Urktani auxiliaries to kneel with their talons on their hooded heads. A stunner bolt flashed, and one of the auxilia fell from the sky. It had been trying to flee. Hold your fire! I snarled and slapped the stunner from the man's hands. Brandishing my sword hilt in the prefect's confused face, I said, Not more than six of them attacked us. The rest are innocent. We'll sort it out, my lord. You will, I said, throwing off my cape as one of my own men um, returned. Is Dr. Ondera safe? The fellow tapped his chest in salute. Aye, lordship, that elder of theirs, my triaster with her, she's fine. I threw my cape at him, seeing the blood on it and on my chest and face. He asked, are you? And I'll stop right there. All right. So I, uh, I guess we will just go right into questions. If uh, anyone has any questions they want to ask about the series, about writing, um, about this book in particular, uh, let's put them in, in the chat. I'm going to go and uh, scroll up and make sure that someone hasn't asked one already. May as well start while people ask. Uh, congrats on your first book as a married man. Thank you, Joel. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Jenna and I got married uh, 29th of February, right before all of this. Uh, right before all of this started, we just barely made it. Managed to have a normal wedding before the world imploded. Um, let's see, uh, 220 pages in. It's fantastic. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, see some familiar faces, Marcus, Joe. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Heather, hello. Um, uh, covers on the wall are nice backdrop. Thanks, Carrie. My brother made those for me. Matt, I don't know if you're watching, but he uh, he printed those out. My uncle is an industrial artist. He does like museum exhibits and stuff. So they printed those for me. The plan eventually, the third floor of this house isn't done. going to make it an office, and it's going all up the staircase. I'm going to do all the covers I can. Um I just got noticed the book of ships going to be a long couple of days. Sorry about that, Ryan. Uh, and for those of you who ordered uh, signed books too, I'm going in the morning to sign them. Quail Ridge just emailed me this morning. Uh, they got their stock in today. So I'm going to go take care of that. And everyone who ordered a signed book, I'm sorry it's going to run a little bit late, but I will get them to you as quickly as humanly possible. Um, let's see. The accent was a nice touch. Thank you, Sean. I uh, I like uh, uh I like doing voices. It's fun. I always uh, thought that maybe being a voice actor would be a fun job, but I have no idea how one gets that job, and I barely know how one becomes a writer. So, uh, um, <laughs> and my brother here he said, don't lie. We know you can't read. It's true. I am illiterate. Um, I have just memorized it all. 
Let's see. Uh, Donovan, hey, I heard something that sounded like Gadadin. Is that based off the old Welsh poem, E. Gadadin? Yes, yes, it is. Um, I actually learned about that in my really indirect route. I'm a big JRPG fan. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time was Tales of Symphonia, and I was playing a later game in that series. I think it was Hysteria. It might have been Vesperia. And there was a village in that called Gadadin. I'm like, that is a cool name. And all the place names in that had something to do with uh, Arthuriana and the British Isles. And I looked it up and found the poem, and I was like, great, I can use this. And so I named a planet after after the Igadadin. Um It's a little bit outside of my... Uh, uh, you know, wheelhouse, as some of you may know, I'm a Greek and Roman uh, scholar more than I am the, the Celtic British stuff. Um, but it was it was, uh, it was a nice find. Let's see. Uh, Michael Johnson, are there any high matter blades that aren't moon pale blue? Uh, I don't know yet. I haven't decided if I want to go the Star Wars route and do uh, different colors. I'm afraid that if I do that, people will be like, oh, these are just lightsabers even more than they already do. Um as high matter swords are, of course, not exactly just lightsabers, uh, but the lightsaber is Star Wars' coolest idea, even though they definitely, uh, you know, got it from earlier uh, bits of science fiction, but they perfected it in Star Wars. And it, of course, has problems. Uh, some of you, actually, I'm blocking it, but there is a sword right there. Um, I've got a bit of a, a sword fighting background, and lightsabers have always bothered me. They bother a lot of people for all sorts of reasons, not least of which is they don't have any uh, mass in the blade. So if you've ever played uh, lightsaber with a flashlight, you will cut your own head off, right? You track that beam right across your body. And so the high matter uh, blade was designed to be a better actually usable lightsaber although if you notice they don't use them properly like swords either because they can't touch them and do grappling moves um and you can also thrust with the edge so there are a couple weird moves hadrian will do that you can't do with a real sword um let's see uh can't wait to pick it up from quill ridge later this week thank you tj uh totally going to voice acting i want to i i like i said i would really love to do uh to really do voice acting but i don't know uh, if I'll ever get the chance, I might try to talk recorded books into letting me do one of the shorter books. Uh, I really, um, uh, if you haven't listened to Lesser Devil yet, I was surprised they got Sam Roken. Delighted, of course, Sam's amazing uh, to do it. But I thought they'd get different uh, different readers because, of course, Lesser Devil's not Hadrian, and I want to do more of those. Um, and so there's a character that I identify with very strongly named Lorian, who appears in this book, and he's in the rest of the series. Um, or at least, you know, maybe. And uh, uh, I would love to do Lorian's story if I ever get to write that one. Um, oh, the reading thing was directed at other Chris. Okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, sell the cover posters. I actually cannot sell the cover posters. I do not have the legal right to do that. The covers, uh, as covers, belong to my publisher. Uh, I just printed those for my personal use because I can kind of get away with that. Um, but the artwork, uh, as they are actually are still the property of the artists, uh, publishing houses. Cause I, I work as an editor as my day job publishing houses, uh, sort of lease the rights to the artwork. Um, the original artwork, uh, is of course, whoever buys the painting from the artist gets to keep that, but the artist retains the legal rights, to the images. So if you want to get, uh, any of these covers, uh, you would need to talk to, talk to the artist. You could send me a message uh, and I could get you links. Sam Weber did uh, Empire of Science. I'm actually going to do a video here on the channel soon. I, uh, I just talked to Sam a little while ago because we did a whole bunch of different cover sketches and Sam's cover sketches are like finished pictures. Uh, when we were trying to get the cover for Empire of Silence, there are four variants. Uh, there's one that's got a busted up helmet. Actually, there are two with busted up helmets. And there's another one that's got a version of Devil's Rest on the cover. And I'm going to show those off in a video and talk about the whole cover process and about Sam. Uh, so if you want to go check out Sam's website, I think it's sampaints.com. You can contact him about getting a print of the art. I'm sure they don't run that much. And the others are, uh, or two and three rather, are done by a guy called Kieran Yanner, which I think uh, K I E. R A N Y A N N E R. And I think, uh, I think it's just kiernyander.com is his website. Same thing. If you want to get those covers, um, you'd have to talk to the artist. This one is my uncle and I might be able to hook you up if you want the lesser devil cover art. Um, and I actually might be able to get away with that one, but we'll see. Um, I, like I said, I will, uh, I'll do that video about the covers and then I'll make sure both of the artists, the main artists that is get linked in that. So I'll do that soon. Uh, Victoria, is there a chapter title you're particularly proud of? Chapter title? Man, that's a good one. Um, 
I can't think of one off the top of my head, uh, although Victoria is the captain of my beta reader, so if she's trying to lead the witness here, I'm sure she'll tell me. Um, one of the things I do like to do about chapter titles, though, is that very often uh, I sneak in song references or poetry references. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a big Black Sabbath fan. There is a um, there's a chapter in this called uh, Those Things You Thought Unreal, uh, which is a line from NIB, which is off the first Black Sabbath album. It's a uh, love song from the devil's perspective to a, uh, a human woman who's captured his heart and may in fact redeem him from being the devil, which of course Hadrian being a devil uh, in a sense is is me being clever because it's a Hadrian Valka uh, uh, chapter. Uh, there's another song uh, reference in this one called Beyond the Doors of the Dark, which is a uh, reference to a more obscure a uh, metal band from the 80s called Sabotage. That's off with, uh, one of their albums called The uh, Hall of the Mountain King, which is one of the best 80s metal albums of all time. If you have not listened to Sabotage, that album is perfect all the way through. Um, and it was appropriately spooky uh, because we may or may not be dealing with the Seelson in that chapter and getting a glimpse of what they are really like. Um, and so there are a lot of there are a lot of musical references, particularly starting in this one, that really started to to filter in because it occurred to me that I could do this. But there are a couple in uh, in books one and two. Uh, I really like to do these song references. Uh, Math Palumbo, have you ever thought about narrating your books? I would love to. Um, I I really would. Uh, Sam Roken uh, does the uh, U.S. recordings. Sam is amazing, and he was actually this is a real fact a Death Eater. I think in the first deathly hallows movie so it's kind of hard to beat a you know a harry potter villain uh but uh, it would be fun to do some uh do some of the reading for sure um let's see uh describe the hardest chapter to write in uh demon in white all right joe um there are a couple and i literally don't know how to describe them without spoiling the book um one of them is hard for similar reasons to the Brethren chapter in Howling Dark. Um, there may or may not be a similar thing uh, in terms of like the weird uh, dialogue structures where we dealt with Brethren, where I had to do that sort of thing again. Because uh, for those of you who only listen to the audio, Brethren's dialogue is sort of written all over the page. It's kind of got a House of Leaves thing going on. Because, of course, Brethren speaks with a lot of different... Um, mouths different voices and it speaks over itself so i was trying to do a little bit of uh what the uh what the literary kids call a uh, concrete poetry get the uh, get the words moved around to do it uh a little weird so there's a little bit of that going on and there was a lot of information in that scene in the same way there was a lot of information with brethren and trying to balance the weirdness and keep the drama up while also uh conveying all of this information at the same time is not the easiest thing to do in the world. The other chapter, um, I, I can't really say anything about. It involves a mountain um, and also some trippy stuff and a flower. And the highest place at the bottom of the world or the lowest place at the top of the world, I can never remember which way I made that go. So it involves that stuff. Uh, and that's all I'll say. Um, let's see. I had a laugh at Jubala in the last book. Any Raleigh Easter eggs this time around? Uh, for, uh, Jubala is a drug in Hadrian's time. It is also the name of a coffee house or a chain of coffee houses in Raleigh, uh, where I live. And it happens to be the favorite coffee house of, uh, my friend, Dr. Uh, Dr. Marcus Gibson, who did the interview with me on this channel. We talked a little bit about philosophy went back when my brain was less functional. Uh, and, it was just a joke at his expense because I am not a coffee drinker. And so I thought, hey, I'll name a drug after it because people who are way too into coffee kind of act like they're on heroin sometimes, especially if they haven't had it in the morning yet. Um, and I just thought it would be funny. Uh, I can't think of any other uh, Raleigh references off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there's something somewhere. Um, let's see. Whoop. Scrolled too far. Let's see. Um, we have to get him gloves uh, made out of that one material high matter can't cut. Uh, adamant. And 
now you're thinking uh, out of the box. Some armor is actually made out of adamant. You can't really make it. Uh, you can't make it flexible. Um, the real problem with using adamant, uh, like carbon nanotube, maybe fibers, because it's also really hard to break for the same reason, um, is that they'll separate. Because uh, high matter is liquid and it's flexile. So if you've got a, a like a, a mesh made out of uh, like an adamant fiber weave, because all it is is, is carbon nanotubes, um, the high matter actually will press right between the fibers and stretch them. And a basically like a needle amount of high matter will get through and stab the person still. Doesn't quite work. Um, let's see. Um, so, but yes, you can in fact defend against high matter. Adamant, uh, adamant does not cut. So keep an eye out for that actually. Um, that's all I'll say. Uh, being a native Greek speaker, I found all those Greek linguistic cameos really cool. Great job. I actually cannot take too much credit for that. Um, some of the words, the ones that I borrowed wholesale maybe, but uh, actually I was talking about Marcus. I think Marcus is listening too. Uh, my friend... Uh, Christopher Marcus Gibson is a uh, a classical philosophy teacher at Princeton, and Marcus uh, reads ancient Greek. And so, whenever I have a, a Greek problem, I go to him. The Latin stuff is is my wheelhouse. Uh, I took Latin and Japanese in school. My Japanese is uh, hugely anemic at this point. I have not used it since high school, uh, except for the occasional um, joke slash meme. Uh, but Latin and Japanese actually informed the grammar structure for the Sielsen language. Uh, Sielsen verbs act like Japanese verbs, and Sielsen nouns act like Latin nouns, and there's a bunch of like weird stuff in there. But the Greek is all Marcus, so thank you, Marcus. Um, let's see, Heather, I have a language construction question. Perfect segue. Um, do you have any favorite books about linguistics, writing languages that guided you in the development of the languages in this series, or did I wing it? I basically winged it. Um, I have my old... Uh, Japanese and Latin uh, grammar books, and I look at those just to like get an idea of how things like noun declensions work. And I can't possibly create a language that's really alien, right? Um, there are a couple sounds I sort of nod at in Cielsen, like the MN sound uh, being one that we can't make because we can't vibrate our nasal passages quite the way that they do, because um, they've got four slits in their face. And we can't do that. There are a couple other sounds. Um, there are some words that they don't have words for, like yes, they just sort of breathe funny. Um, but basically any language you're going to make is going to be human. So why not steal pieces of other languages? I, um, when I'm writing the book, I skip the translating of Cielsen until the end. I'll flag them with the lines with carrots. Um, and then I go back and translate them all at once so that I'm only in one mode. And I've got this horrible notebook that's uh, – I can't quite reach it without unplugging myself – that's got sentence-by-sentence sentence, uh, translations because I invent the grammar as I need it. I'm like, uh, oh, crap, this sentence has a participle in it, and I figure out how to do all that. Um, the other languages, Judean, uh, Lothrian, all of these, are not even really languages. They just sound good. Um, Judean is supposed to be – a uh, sort of argo in the way that English is an argo of, of Anglo-Saxon and French with some Greek influences. Uh, Judean is supposed to be Greek and Italian and Arabic and a little Farsi because the people who became the Judeans uh, left Earth in generation ships and they were all from those parts of the world. And so there's this sort of weird um, Greco-Persian-Arabian mix that became Judean. And so when I do that, I take, um, I, I, I look through Google translate, um, for what the word is in Italian, Greek, Farsi, and Arabic. And then I pick either the one that sounds coolest and then misspell it and then sort of work it into, that's why there's very little Judean or Lothrian sentences. There are a couple little stock phrases. Uh, I just want it there for flavor because trying to actually be Tolkien is, beyond my powers, and so I'm only going to do the one one language at a time. Uh, so I would just look at some grammar books, Heather, if you're trying to um, trying to make up your own language. Uh, pick a couple languages that you think do cool things if you know, like, the Japanese doesn't have tense. Uh, it only has two tenses, rather. It has no number. So there, you can't actually say samurais in Japanese. You can just say samurai, and then you have to be specific about the number. 
Um, so if you know, like a little thing, I would look at those aspects and sort of roll them all in. Um, let's see, Michael, what's your take on Paradise Lost and has it influenced your work at all? It is super weird you asked that question, Michael, because I accidentally ranted about this in the office today. Um, I love Paradise Lost, obviously. Um, there are a lot of references to it. Uh, in in Howling Dark in particular, he's got a lot of Dante and Milton going on. Demon in White still's got some, but it's dropped that off a bit. Um, I think that the sort of Will, uh, William Blake interpretation that Satan is really the good guy is dumb, and William Blake should feel bad for thinking that. He's an excellent poet. Um, I love his poem Milton, which is about this, um, where the uh, the hymn Jerusalem comes from, and did those feet in ancient times. Um, but I think that he's, I think that he's wrong. I think that William Blake thinks the way that a lot of modern critics think, which is that, uh, I can read my interpretation into the text. And he decided that Milton basically was in the devil's camp without knowing it, right. Is the, is the famous quote. Um, I think that thinking that is wrong. If he had said Milton was trying to justify God's actions to man in Paradise Lost, and he didn't do a very good job, I think that would be a defensible position. Because defending, you know, if God is all-powerful, why is there evil in the world, is, is like the fundamental difficult theological question. It's, or at least one of, one of many. Um, it, you know, theodicy is what it's called. And I won't rant too much about it. But um, I think that if you read that poem with the assumption that maybe Satan is the good guy, um, then you're wrong. Uh, I think Milton meant Satan to be the bad guy. I think he is a villain protagonist. Um, and that when he says things like, it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, he's being an edgy high school kid, and you should interpret um, Satan's character that way, not as a cool, edgy rebel that we should identify with in that poem. I don't think it's what Milton meant at all. Um, and I also think that that's exactly backwards. I think that it's way better to be a nobody in in heaven, right? And, and this can be, you could take that, you know, literally in a theological sense or, or metaphysically. I think it's way better to be a peasant, basically, in a functioning uh, morally upright society than it is to be king of a garbage heap. And that's what Satan is in Paradise Lost. He's king of the garbage heap. Um, rant over. Um, really nailed the Emperor's cover wardrobe. Just the right amount of power and restraint. Yes, I I am such a fan of uh, the... I love all the covers, obviously, but the two that Kieran did, uh, Howling Dark and Demon in White, he really like managed to get the, the granular detail of the characters and the costuming just exactly right um with karn and with uh and with the uh with the emperor here too um the only thing that's like slightly off about either of them is that karn should have dark hair um but they're otherwise like spot on um let's see uh, hey, Christopher, it's Nick, and congrats on the new release. Mind if I ask how you got so good at storytelling? I've always been interested in, in how people craft strong characters and arcs. Um, reading, this is like the, the sort of basic author answer to this question, is that one gets good at writing by reading. I, uh, I read a lot. I actually listened a lot. Um, I struggle, especially now, to sit down and actually physically read a book. I used to be really good at it, and I just can't do it anymore, because that's what I do for my day job. I, I work as a, an editor, so I don't expect any pity, because I know some of you will think that's super cool. Um, uh, so I read all day, and then I come home and I write stories, and the last thing I, I want to do is look at another book. I feel really bad. I owe, um, I owe a couple friends quotes for their books, and it's just hard for me to not uh, play Civilization VI um, and listen to metal music uh, when I want to do something with my free time. Uh, so I listened to a lot of books. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents got me the uh, complete CD uh, Lord of the Rings audiobook, uh, which is still the recording that's on Audible, the Rob Inglis recorded book ones. Um, this is back when audio books were sort of weird and no one knew what to do with them. You can still kind of hear office chatter and opening doors in the background. It's not all clean yet. Um, and I listened to those like almost until the CDs wore out, which is like harder than cassettes wearing out for, 
Um, I, I must have listened to Lord of the Rings like a hundred times uh, in my life. And I've listened to a few other books about that much. But Lord of the Rings is the big one. Um, and I'm a huge uh, – I was an early adopter of Audible. I've been doing that since like like 2010 or something. I forget. Um and so I listen to a lot of stories because I think good stories have to sound good because as people don't think about literature as an auditory medium, but it is. People didn't start reading in their heads until like 200 years ago. Um, there are uh, anecdotes about Julius Caesar bringing in um, uh, foreign dignitaries and reading silently in front of them like while he was waiting, like, you know, forcing them to wait. And then putting the writing down, I mean, they're like, yes, what is it? Because reading silently in your head was like almost magical. It was weird. Um, and so when people read stories, like when they – this is why poetry was such a big thing. When people read, they read that out loud so they could hear it and so their you know, people around them could hear it. And so there's still a part of us that recognizes literature as an auditory medium. And so I try to write – at a sentence level uh, that sound that sounds good to hear. So I can't listen to music when I'm writing because I'm, I'm constantly speaking to myself. I, I look like a crazy person when I do this in Barnes and Noble. So I try to be really quiet um, writing in the cafe. Um, but the thing I, I, I really believe that most people already kind of understand character and they understand plot uh, because you tell stories to your friends, right? Uh, and when you tell stories to your friends, you're you're talking about this weird guy I saw, right? Like, and he was like doing this weird, like talk. He was talking to himself at Barnes and Noble, right? And you generate the impression of that character because a lot of of what people do when they build characters is actually happening in the reader's head. It's happening in the audience, right? Like, I have never told you what Polino's nose looks like, for instance. And you know it, right? There's a lot of like fidgeting that you might see a character doing that's not on the page. Um, a lot of what I do is auto-completed in your head. And so uh, a couple of grace notes about what a character is like goes a really long way. If you look at epic poetry, right? If you look at Homer, um, he just tells you – he uses like stock phrases for certain characters, right? Hector is master of horses, right? And he repeats these like little details about them and about how they're like noble and upright or, or you know, Odysseus was always scheming. And you kind of generate a picture of the character based on a couple details. So actually trust the audience more is, uh, is one of my first bits of advice. But I think that where most people struggle is with style. Um, so I would just try to practice making sentences that sound good. And if you find yourself struggling about what to write in terms of scene and, and plot structure, you probably need to outline. We have this idea that writers sit down and they just like have an idea and they go with it. And, um, and, and they do that beginning to end and they finish the book. That's not how it works, right? Uh, there are some writers who can do that. Uh, Stephen King, I think, is uh, very upfront about being someone who doesn't know what he's writing when he sits down. Um, the odds that you are Stephen King, the odds that I am Stephen King are zero because I'm not Stephen King and neither are you. Um, so it might be good to assume that you need more scaffolding. So sit down and actually come up with a plan, right? I, um, I will show you. Here's about a third of the outline for book four. I will face it away from you so no one can see because the title is on every page and I'm not going to share it with you. Um, this outline is, for the whole book is about 30,000 words long, which is about half of a Sorcerer's Stone. I use Harry Potter as standard units of measure since you've all seen them. Uh, so that's just the outline. Uh, I'll do like a chapter, a page, and then break down scenes and remind myself like what I want going through characters' heads in those scenes. And I almost use it like a low-resolution draft, right? Because if my whole chapter is a page of notes and I want to throw that out and change something, I haven't lost something as opposed to a real chapter, which could be 10, 20 pages, losing that, that's like a day, two days work. That sucks. Losing an outline page, no big deal. Uh, I hope that helps. Um, if, it, you know, not just you, Nick, but anyone who wants to write. Uh, Josiah, is Genon ever going to make an appearance later? Just curious. Do you really want me to, to, to spoil things? Um, you know, uh, I, uh, maybe. Let's just say maybe. Um, Mostly because I'm not quite sure yet. Of course, some of these characters will be coming back. Um, 
I, I don't want to say which ones. Some of them won't be um, as well. I, I'm sorry to hedge the hedge, hedge the answer there, Josiah, um, but I uh, I might not know in some cases. Uh, Genon might be one of them, but some characters will return, some won't. But I haven't forgotten about any of them, I promise you. Even if they don't show up in Hadrian's narrative again, there are certain characters um, who might get their own little side adventures. I had a, a real good time writing The Lesser Devil, and I want to do more of that for sure. Um Hang on. I just moved and it jumped the whole thing. Let's see. Where'd it go? Um, scrolled a little bit too far. Sorry, everybody. Uh, sabotage rules. Yes, finally. Awesome. Uh, I'm glad someone knows. Uh, completely unrelated. Is that the Berserk manga I see on your bookshelf? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've got Akira too, And... Uh, uh, Battle Angel Alita is right there as well. Full Metal Alchemist is hanging out over there. It got exiled because I ran out of space. Um, and I've got uh, the Tales of Symphonia manga in Japanese and a couple of the Legend of Zelda adaptations too because I really liked those growing up. Um, especially the Oracle of Ages one was surprisingly good. They added a bunch of stuff. Anyway, a uh, huge Berserk fan. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you because for those of you who read Berserk, you might that might give you a... a the feeling of dread as to where the series is going. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, let's adjust that a little bit. There we go. Um, yeah. Huge berserk fan. I've been buying the deluxe editions, uh, cause K Kitaro Miura is perhaps the greatest manga artist of all time. Uh, the granular detail, the amount of research he puts into getting actually, I won't say period accurate, but historically real examples of armor, uh, on his characters and stuff, it's it's amazing. If you haven't read Berserk, if you guys are comics or manga fans, um, it's perhaps the greatest uh, fantasy manga series of all time. It's still ongoing. It's notoriously slow to update. So if you guys are a little cagey about like George R. R. Martin and 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 about uh, Name of the Wind and stuff, it may not be something to get into because it's something you'll be waiting on for a while. But it's amazing. It's very dark. It's very gruesome. So if that's not your thing, maybe not. But it's it's really cool. Um, uh, David, hey David, thank you for being here, man. I know it's late over there in the UK. Uh, and the quiet. Do we learn much more about them? Absolutely, David. Oh, absolutely. We're going to learn more about the quiet. Hopefully, not too much though, because I don't want to destroy the mystery. That's a hard line to walk. Uh, Justin, congrats! Excited for the book. Uh, how long did it take you to complete your world building for the series? And did I finish the world building before writing? Um, awesome question. Uh, I have been world building something or other since I was about eight. Um, like most kids, I played make believe on the playground at school. Um, a couple of my friends actually from those days are in here, Joe, Marcus. Uh, we go all the way back to like third grade. I think for me, they're a grade above me or a grade above me. Um, and we, uh, we goofed around before them. Even, uh, there were some other people too. And we played, uh, we just played make believe. I uh, it started out. A couple of my friends were playing Dragon Ball Z and invited me to play, but I was not allowed to watch that. And so I asked them if I could be Batman, and they thought about it, you know, as kids do for about a week. And they're all like, "Peter and I have been talking, and you're in Batman." So I was Batman, and they were Goku and Vegeta. So I was a little bit outclassed in the power department, which took me a couple, you know, weeks to learn. And after they moved on and developed social skills and got good at sports, um, and I did not, I just kept making up the stuff that we played with because our characters stopped being Batman and Goku after, you know, like a year. We're like, what if I like was Batman, but also could use the force so that I could kind of keep up with Goku. And they're all like, we'll allow it. Um, and so eventually that sort of make believe snowballed into trying to write my own story. Right. Cause I, I was listening to Lord of the Rings so much. And when I started out, it was a fantasy story. It bears virtually no resemblance to what we ended up with. Um, there are some weird things that suck around a couple place names, a couple character names, um, but not too much. And, and slowly like the ship of Theseus, which, uh, those of you who read Howling Dark will know I'm fond of, uh, I swapped out parts and parts and parts, but at no point did I ever, put what I was writing as a kid away. I never put Batman down, right, so to speak. I never stopped actually write, you know, writing this, 
what I'd been writing as a kid. And it's like, all right, here's the line. I drew it. This is a new project. I just sort of grew into it. And so there's no moment, right? Like Robert E. Howard talks about like seeing Conan one day, right? Just sort of strode up to him and said, you must write my story, um, you know, Howard of Texas. And I can't speak to that, right? J.K. Rowling said she saw Harry Potter on a train. Um, Hadrian has sort of grown up with me, uh, his universe too. And so I actually have remarkably few world building notes, uh, I have a bunch of disorganized pieces of paper where I keep track of complicated things like the Legion rank structure, which I should probably do a video on, um, or like how the chantries, uh, different groups are oriented and which ministries the Empire has and what they do. Um, but like in terms of throwaway details, like I'll mention that a planet, I think it was, I think, what was the planet? It was Ashe Ra had dragons on it. And I was like, yeah, they've got dragons on that planet. Uh, I just put that in because I thought Hadrian should make a reference to dragons being a thing that exist because um, we needed monsters to fight. And whenever I establish a world building rule, I stick to it, um, which I, I was relieved to learn is something that Lois McMaster Bujold does, too. Um, she builds as much world as she needs to tell a story and she doesn't do any more because – uh, I didn't finish world building before I started writing the story. World building is an ongoing process. And I think a lot of people think that they need to be like Tolkien and they need to have six languages and 10,000 years of history and 30 gods and three different religions and, and currency systems and, and, and the rank structures of five different imperial armies. You don't need all of that. Tolkien is a bad role model. Um, for the working writer, because one needs to remember that Tolkien published two books, two novels, really, in his lifetime. He published The Hobbit, and he published Lord of the Rings, which is one book in three volumes, which is what a trilogy really is. It's not three stories. It's one story in three volumes. Um, sorry, I'm pedantic about that. Um, I will calm down. Um, he wasn't churning out material, right? He wasn't like a Brandon Sanderson. And so if you want to be a working writer, and in order to be uh, competitive in the marketplace in 2020 AD, you need to put out a lot of stuff. Um, unless you're really famous, then you can get away with taking a break. Because there's uh, uh, there's an interview with, uh, I think it was Blackie Lawless, who's a, a metal guy from from the 80s. And, and he said he was real nervous about taking a few years off to you know sort of deal with some of his problems right he's a rock star in the 80s because he's worried his audience had forgotten about him and i think that's a that's a real problem um with writers today there's so many writers uh that if we if i don't put out content i'm worried you guys might forget about me so i need to keep uh keep turning out content book four is about half done for this reason um and i think a lot of people sorry this is a bit of a tangent want to world build more than they want to write the actual plot, and that's awesome. World building is a super fun, super cool hobby. But if you want to tell a story, you need the world building to serve that story. So you need to figure out what that story is first and then figure out uh, all the little details. Now, you might need to build a little bit of a world to fit that story in. You can't talk about um, – Let's say that the I can't talk about the Solon Empire without having imagined the Solon Empire first, right? But I don't know where all the planets are and what they're for and where Hadrian's from and why that matters until I know a little bit about who Hadrian is and what I want his story to be. And so there's a balance there that you need to find. Um, but my advice would be to err on the side of doing more storytelling and less world building. Um, until you've got the story planned. Um, but you need a uh, world build enough to do uh, the outline, to tell your story. Uh, Alexander, do Switch and Hadrian ever come back together and get along again? That would be telling. Um, like I said with Josiah's question, I don't want to give away who might be coming back or why, because some people certainly are coming back. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to ruin everything. Hadrian's already ruined the whole blowing up a sun thing for us. So let's keep some of the other things secret. Cause I'm not so upset about having ruined the whole blowing up a star thing. Got your attention. Um, but the rest of the stuff I kind of want to hold back because I think the journey of uh, the how and the why and the what is more interesting than the, where we're going. Um, I, uh, I feel bad about what happened with switch. Uh, he's a good dude. And that ultimately was, why he uh, made the choice that he made. Uh, he 
didn't want his friend to be making what he thought was terrible mistakes. Uh, but sometimes we have to do terrible things in order to make the world um, better, as unfortunate as that is. Um, and so Switch's great crime, I think, is being uh, too good a friend. Um, any hints about the cover for book four? Uh, none that are final. Um, like I've said in a couple of the other videos, I don't want to give away the title just yet. A little early. Um, because Salesforce has not finalized it. They changed Empire of Silence's title. It was originally The Murdered Sun, S-U-N, but they didn't like that because, one, that happens in the last book, not the first one, and two, is it Sun with a U or Sun with an O? Because when you're talking, you don't know. So sometimes Salesforce changes uh, title for marketing reasons, and I'm just going to wait till I know it's stuck. But as far as the art goes, um, and I know a lot of people have been asking about this. So the plan right now, as I understand it, is that book four, obviously we're sticking with single people. So you can assume there's going to be a figure, a, uh, a figure on each one. Um, book four we're thinking is finally going to be uh, the king of the Cielsen, or the uh, the one who would be king of the Cielsen, to make a Kipling reference. Uh, reference uh, Siriani Doryaika, uh, who we talk about right in the first chapter, of book one, the scourge of earth. Uh, the plan is that maybe book four will have it on the cover. That's my hope. Uh, possibly Salesforce will uh, be like, eh, maybe not. We should, we shouldn't do the weird, scary HR Geiger monster on the cover. Um, and they might veto me. They vetoed uh, demon and white. I wanted to have uh, Hadrian and Valka together on, on the cover, but they were like, eh, it might look a little too romancy. Um, and so we went with the emperor instead. So we got another guy in a chair, but uh, what a guy in the chair, right? I really love, by the way, the marble work around the the solar throne in that cover. Kieran is awesome. Uh, proud of you, man. Thanks, Alex. You're one of the good ones. Uh, Doom guy. How many memes made it into the book? Uh, several. Uh, there's one scene in particular uh, where uh, I think one character manages to fire off two meme phrases uh, back to back, and I think one of them is "All right, then keep your secrets." The Lord of the Rings meme. I can't resist, guys. In the same way that I can't resist referencing uh, Milton and Dante, I cannot resist putting in stupid memes. So uh, you're welcome. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Marcus. Oh, let's see. Uh, is there any particular culture or specific cultural artifact you haven't yet used that you'd like to draw on in your future world building? I really want to do something with the, uh, the Japanese. Uh, the Nipponese, uh, Hadrian has referenced, are still around. Um, the, uh, the Japanese are one of the few uh, groups of people who are around today in real life who are still around as distinctly themselves in Hadrian's time. Um, uh, Japanese culture is a very, uh, strong sense of itself uh, and of its own identity. And so it seems to me like they would make it, uh, they would make it a really, uh, a really long time. And I'd love to do a story about a Solon Imperial Knight who is a Nipponese samurai, right? Who's still around, right? Cause the, uh, the, the Japanese Imperial family, uh, is house Yamato. Uh, who run Yamato Interstellar and a couple other of the big corporations. They're still around. Uh, House Yamato, actually, because there's, there's this one writer on Twitter, and I forget who it was, who said that uh, one of the things she hates about sci-fi and fantasy is thousand-year institutions, right? Things don't last that long in real life, she said. That's insane, because not only um, you know, is, is the Catholic Church 2,000 years old, uh, and still here in basically the same form. Um, but the Imperial family of Japan is like 2,500 years old, and it's basically an unbroken line. Um, they basically trace their ancestry back to Amaterasu, the, the sun goddess, which, of course, you know, probably not. Um, but they, they've got a straight line from Jimu, the first emperor, to the, the current guy. And I think that'd be really cool. Um, I would like to do more with uh, with the Catholic Church too, for the same reason. I, I the, of course, institutions can last thousands of years. There are a few examples of them. There was a, a construction company in Japan that was founded in like the 500s, and it only went out of business in like 2010. 
And it actually still exists. It got bought out by a bigger company. So I want to do stuff with these long institutions. Um, and I'd like to do more with the Catholic Church and how they're surviving under the chantry. Because, um, of course, the chantry, why would they tolerate that, even though the church has some sort of weird arrangement with the emperor, uh, w which gets hinted at in, in, in Lesser Devil? I want to deal with that. And there's some other groups, too, that might have been around a really long time that I'd like to work with. Um, the other one that's worth mentioning is uh, there have been a couple references to the Siddhartha, right, which is obviously the stupidest and best pun that I, I, I have ever made. Uh, it's uh, King Arthur and the Buddha have been sort of confused into the same person. And I would love to do something that focuses on that religion and how the King Arthur story and the Buddha story have like kind of got some parallels in them. And I would love to do a story with a character who's really into that. That would be fun. Let's see. Um, I was wondering if you have done any archaeological reading to inform your writing. I must compliment you on how you portray my craft. I uh, still love the dig site from book one. Thanks, Mario. Uh, I forgot that you were an archaeologist. I'm jealous. You have a cooler job than mine. Um, I uh, I missed an opportunity in college uh, to go to, to uh, Petra in Jordan. Um, I, I really wish I had done that now. Uh, which is, of course, you know, it's cool ancient city. If you've seen Indiana Jones three, it's where the Grail was. That's Petra. It's a real place. Um, I have done a little bit of reading because I, I have uh, obviously I have an ancient history background, and so I know a little bit about how uh, how archaeology is done. By no means am I an expert, um, but uh, but uh, I did a little bit of of, of looking just because I I don't want to be obviously wrong. Uh, especially about technical things because someone like you Mario who knows what they're talking about be like Christopher you screwed up um, and then I don't want to feel you know like a fool uh, Anders whenever the sign of the sun disc is mentioned forehead lips chest I always think of making the sign of the cross at uh, the same place as prior to the gospel reading at mass any connection yes uh, for those of you who aren't Catholic or Orthodox before the gospel you draw a sign of the cross here here and here the sign of the sun disc they go here and in my head, it's actually here, 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 even though I know Hadrian says this. Um, you make a circle, like an OK sign, because you can put it around the sun. And if you're on a planet, people very often will, will hold it up to the sun and then here, 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 and then back to the sun. The Chantry did get that idea from Christianity. Uh, there's a bit in The Lesser Devil where uh, Father Laurent tells Crispin that the, the Chantry basically just ripped off a bunch of old religions, right? Um, chantry sanctums have minarets. They stole those from mosques. Um, they stole that bit of symbolism from Christianity because the Chantry is a fake religion, right? Hadrian makes no bones about this. They made up everything um, basically as a propaganda project to help reinforce people, um, uh, people's distrust of technology because what the Marikani did to humanity was so dangerous and so awful that it should never happen again. And it's better that everybody from the Chantry's perspective, it's better that everybody um, live the way that the empire lives than risk and a second Marikani situation. Um, let's see the vinyl version of uh, Lord of the Rings. Wow. All right. Uh, my hat is off to you. Um, I listened to Silmarillion audiobooks over and over too. Me too, David. Um, I also had those on CD. Uh, I don't know what happened to them. They used to be here somewhere along with my Wagner opera. Anyway, they got lost when I moved. It'll turn up. Um, let's see. Uh, when do we get a Bassander Lynn story? Um, and <laughs> I didn't realize there were other Lynn fans in this world. Lynn is the boy. Next comment. Um I uh, I have an idea for a Bassander Lynn story. Actually, I have two ideas for a Bassander Lynn story. One is a prequel. One is a sequel. I don't want to do either of them until Bassander gets uh, gets his day in the main series. So we get a little bit more look at who he is. I uh, I like Bassander too. Bassander is a, an absolute uh, uh, stick. Uh, stickler, stick in the mud, pick what you want. He follows those rules precisely because, by God, he knows those rules keep people alive, and he is just not flexible on that at all. And he's right about that. The world is too damn dangerous to act like Hadrian does. Hadrian gets people hurt. Um, damn fool. Um, and I... Uh, yeah, I, I like Bassander Lynn. So, I... 
with the side stories like Crispin's, I don't really want to do them until we know more about that character and who they are. Cause obviously doing their own side story before their arc sort of plays in the main series is going to, uh, going to sort of undercut the experience. So like, I know you guys want to see more of Sir Oleron, right? Uh, I love Sir Oleron. I love the Judeans. I am reading reams of Persian history books to learn more about what I think Jad should be like before we go there. Um, I would love to do more with sword masters, but there's more to come from Sir Oleron and Hadrian's story that I don't want to undercut yet uh, by, you know, uh, setting the charge off too soon. Uh, and, and in the same way, there are other characters too, like people wanted uh, uh, a Valka story and they wanted that after Empire of Silence, but I hadn't had Valka tell you guys she was a, a Tavarosi soldier, right? I didn't want to ruin that by writing a story about her being a Tavarosi soldier. I do have a Valka story in mind too. Um, I tried to write that before I wrote Demon in White and or before, yeah, before I wrote Demon in White. Everything's blurring together, man. Um, and I sort of ruined it uh, and I need to start again. Hadrian and, uh, is in it and, and Hadrian and Valka's relationship is something I only understand from his perspective, I realized. Um, and I'm convinced that in one of the ways that Hadrian is lying to us in his book, right, in his account, is that he's making himself look worse than he is because he feels guilty. Um, and I think part of that is he makes himself look a bit stupider in his relationship um, than Valka sees him. And I think Valka, Valka must see Hadrian in the best possible light because that's what people that we care about do, right? Like they, if they really care about us, they see us maybe even more honestly than we do, because we usually put ourselves down more than other people do. Um, I know Jenna thinks I'm a much better person than I think I am, for instance, and I need to get a handle on that. Um, so let's see. Um, how many side novels do I have planned? Sounds like about half a dozen now. Planned is a strong word, Anders. Uh, like I say, I, I don't have too many planned I know what Valka's story needs to be about, and I have a bad outline for it, so I need to do a new outline. I have Lorian's story figured out. I know what it needs to be. Um, Lorian is someone who's new in book three, and I hope by the end of book three you will agree he absolutely deserves his own story. I love him. Um, he is probably my favorite character to write. Um, uh, they are, they are, I want to do stories for them. I want to do a story at some point for, for Lynn. I want to do a story for Otavia. Uh, I would like to do, or I would like to do a story for Otavia at some point. Um, and for Jinan. um, I don't know that all of these will happen. And I know you, a couple people really want to see Elson's story. I will try. Um, but the Cielsen explicitly don't think like human beings. And I'm not sure that if I wrote a Cielsen story, its internal logic would make sense to people. Um, and so that could be really fun. And maybe they give me an award for writing a weird art piece. Um, but I could try it. Um, so I would like to do that too. Um, let's see. Lynn is very underrated. I agree. Um, where did I gain inspiration for the extra Solarians and Hadrian's reaction to the bone cutters and the flesh markets? Um, ah, man, this is a tricky one because I don't know how to answer it without being too uh, spicy. Um, the extra Solarians, uh, well, they're sort of libertarians, right? But that's not that's not all that's going on. They're also postmodernists. They're transhumanists. Um, and these are all like real philosophies. And I don't, when I'm writing, I try not to have a problem with certain philosophies, right? But transhumanism in particular, this idea, and this is something that Marx and I talked about in our, our interview video a lot. Mind you, my brain is not entirely plugged in in that interview. I'd been locked up in my house too long. Um, and transhuman this idea that like you can put your brain in a computer and somehow still be the same person is weird to me because neuroscience tells us very clearly, right, that we think the way we do because we have an entire body through which we filter our experiences, right? Um, there are parts of your brain, right? You have a nerve that maps from your eye directly onto your spine. So if you see something like a snake, your eye will actually see that uh, snake before your 
visual centers in your brain process it and relay that information directly to your spine to make you jump. Because by the time it gets to your brain and your stupid brain makes a decision, you're dead. The snake's gotten you. Um, and so you need to bypass the brain because it's too damn slow. So there are actually parts of your behavior that aren't in your brain. And so if you throw those things away, right, if you cut your arms off, um, you can't solve problems the same way anymore. And that changes who you are as a person, right? If you heard the story about Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker in the 19th century, he had a railroad tie uh, shoot straight through his jaw and sever his prefrontal cortex and it completely changed who he was, right? So you can't actually change. There's this stupid meme about how we're, um, we're ghosts in meat suits, like meat Gundams. And I hate that idea, not only because it's Gnosticism, um, but because it's scientifically wrong, you are uh, a fully integrated uh, uh, mind-body duality, right? And you can't have one of those things suffer harm without the other changing. And even in subtle ways, right? Like, I, like I'm saying, people who lose arms have to address problems differently. Um, people uh, who lose these limbs like learn to feel things differently because their sensory cortex remaps things. Um, the brain is plastic. It changes. Um, and so I thought about that a lot. And Hadrian's grossed out by that because Hadrian is classically educated. And this idea that you could destroy your body and still be the same person would have freaked out Aristotle and it would have freaked out Plato. Um, and Hadrian has read Aristotle and Plato and knows that and knows – he also knows a little bit of the neurological literature because Gibson is a good teacher, just like my boy Gibson. Um and uh, sorry, I have to make fun of Marcus. He's here. It's it's too easy. I love you, man. Um, and so Hadrian knows all this, and he knows that it's wrong scientifically, philosophically, and ethically. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it. You can do a lot of things that are wrong. You can make yourself an eight foot spider person. Um, that's probably going to be bad for you, which is why most of the extras are morally insane. It's why Karn Sagara is Karn, right? He's just meat at this point. Whoever he used to be died thousands of years ago. Karn is not the same person anymore. Now that Karn is two people, you'll notice the two Karns act differently because they're in different bodies, and those bodies have different neurochemistry and different capabilities. Um, and yes, that is something I want to do more with. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's where, where I got that from. Uh, how do I make character outlines? Do, do I make character outlines like I do plot outlines? Uh, or how do you go about building characters' personalities? Uh, I don't make character outlines separately. Uh, I will work in subnotes in chapters because I outline by the chapter and then by the scene. I'll make notes about how uh, how characters I want how I want characters to progress scene to scene, what I want them to do differently, think differently, how I want them to change. Um, the big one, obviously, is Hadrian because every word that we get in these books is part of who Hadrian is. If Hadrian is stopping to tell you uh, how green the trees are, right, to, to make the riff on that joke people make about Tolkien, it's because Hadrian's the sort of person who likes to talk about that kind of thing. Hadrian's the sort of person who does like the sound of his own voice, even when he feels bad about his life choices and his actions. And, um, you know, uh, so I sit down at the beginning of each book, and there's usually a time skip, because I'm, I'm thinking like Star Wars episodes, right? Excuse me. Um, None of the Star Wars movies take place directly after the last one, except Last Jedi, which picks up right after um, Episode 7. And I guess Rogue One, but Rogue One's a special, special thing. Uh, they all have time gaps, right? And that allows the characters to uh, – allows us to meet the characters at the beginning of each Star Wars film in a new place, right? It allows them to grow. It would have been a great idea, for instance, if instead of making Last Jedi happen immediately after Episode 7, we could have put Rey's training in, and then everyone who complained about that would have to shut up, right? Because we would have covered Rey's training in the gap. Gaps are useful. I can hide character progression in there, and I can have us meet characters in new places. Hadrian in particular is not the same person at 113 years old in this one that he was at 35 in the last book, and he's not the same person at 333 in book four um, that he is at 113 in this one, right? And so I have to sort of rethink where that is, so I just work that into the plot outline. Um Let's see. Whoop. Oh, wow, there are way more. And for the record, I'm happy to do this as long as you guys want to hang out. I know we're at about an hour and a half already. Um, 
I will keep doing this until the questions stop this evening because this is, as I said, a party. Um, but I understand if people need to leave early, don't feel like you gotta, uh, you know, you gotta stay out of some sense of obligation. Although there is a surprise at the end, uh, I just hope it won't be anticlimactic. Let's see. Um, thousand percent in favor of scary HR Geiger monsters on the cover. This is why I like you, Heather. Um, you're one of the good ones, as I say. Uh, peeps in chairs. Yes, that is the theme for the cover art ever since. I think if we get number book four in a chair too, and the number five, they can be standing again. We'll complete the complete the visual arc. Um, let's see. Uh, especially the stages interstellar, very easy for remnants of old tradition to continue to exist, even if the original center of power got taken out. Exactly, Donovan. Yes. Um, we're talking back about like the Catholic Church and the Japanese imperial family, things like that. Obviously, no one is in Japan anymore, but they're still House Yamato. They have their own planet now. Uh, so does the church. They move the Vatican brick by brick to another planet because we don't want to lose any of that cool Renaissance art. Um, could we get a Murakami war story or a Karn youth story? Um, as of right now, to the Marikani prequel story, I want to say no. Um, I think that a lot of power in uh, world building, right, uh, comes from questions, right? The, the Shakespeare uh, scholar Stephen Greenblatt calls a strategic opacity. Um, I don't want to take away the mystery, because if I take away too much of the mystery, it stops being cool. This is the problem with prequels, right? Uh, looking at you, other end of the Star Wars timeline, since I complained about the sequels here. The Clone Wars, in my head when I was a kid, involved, like, Man in the Iron Mask-style clone fake kings and, like, territorial disputes because nobody knew who was real or if, like, this clone of, like, the dead king has, you know, like, uh, primogeniture rights over his own kid or, like, how that would work. And instead it was a bunch of clones of Tamara Morrison, who is awesome, uh, but I was not expecting just clone stormtroopers. I was expecting something way more complicated. And so I got let down by the prequels. Not that, uh, you know, the Clone Wars cartoon isn't cool. You know, um, sarcastic cartoon Obi-Wan is pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah. Um, I don't really want to do that story just because if I tell you too much about the Murakani, I think it'll ruin the fun. Uh, Especially because it's so much closer to now. The Foundation War, or rather the reign of the Marikani, starts, I think, in the 24, 2500s. Uh, I'm not trying to be one of those sci-fi writers who's like, it happened in 2001 AD, because obviously we lived to 2001, and we didn't go to Jupiter, and I'm still sad about it. Um, I was let down. But... Uh, it's still close enough that things will be recognizable. And if I start trying to talk about what America's up to, right, and what happened in Europe and what China's uh, – I don't want to get too political and too granular, and there's no way to do that story without being too political. Um, and I am – I mean, obviously, I'm a person who has uh, political beliefs, philosophical beliefs, theological beliefs. But when I'm entertaining, I want – the philosophical, political, ideological beliefs of my characters to matter, not mine. Um, obviously, you know, I might put my thumb down uh, a little harder than others on certain things, um, you know, uh, but I'm trying to tell uh, uh, as balanced and as grounded in character a story as I can, right? Um, Dostoevsky, right, in Brothers Karamazov, his, like, strongest, most well-written character is Ivan, right? Ivan wins every single argument with his brother Alyosha that they have. His Ivan is brilliant, he's handsome, he's successful, and Alyosha is kind of dim and, 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 like, he's, like, a good dude, but he's just, he can't compete with Ivan. And Ivan is an atheist, and Dostoevsky was not, right? And people come away from that book thinking that Ivan, you know, sort of won, but Ivan kind of loses out in that book because he ends up kind of miserable, right? And Alyosha is all right. And that's because it's better to serve in heaven than reign in hell, fundamentally, to go back to the Milton thing. And Dostoevsky gives the devil his due, right? He makes Ivan's arguments really, really strong, but he doesn't believe Ivan's arguments, and he lets the characters act it out, right? There's still a message from the author in there, but it's it's much stronger because it's more balanced. And I, I, I really – I am not saying I'm Dostoevsky. I will never be that good. I don't think anyone ever has been since. But gosh, I'm going to try. 
And if I can get 2% of the way there, it puts me ahead of a lot of other, a lot of other people. I need a switch novella. I failed to, uh, I failed to mention him when I was doing this. I really do want to do something with Switch 2. I don't know what yet. Um, but don't worry, Alexander. I haven't, f I haven't forgotten he exists. Um, I don't know what I could do that wouldn't be sad or totally unrelated. Like, Switch runs off and becomes his own mercenary captain. That could be fun. But you never know. Um, it's really hard for me to get whole ideas. They don't come to me full-formed like Mozart with his symphonies. I have to really think about it. The fact that you love uh, Berserk has only increased my appreciation of you. Um, you mentioned we should be worried. Did you draw inspiration from Berserk? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Berserk is so good, uh, especially in terms of character. Uh, it's it's just it's really awesome. And so there is some stuff there if you're paying attention. Um, Berserk really is interesting to me, too. I'm going to go on a brief tangent it, because it references old sci-fi stories. It's a Frank Herbert reference in Berserk. I don't know if, uh, if any of you are fans. You might not have noticed that the, the archdemons in that uh, Void, Slan, Conrad, and uh, Ubik are all named after old 60s sci-fi books. Destination Void by Frank Herbert, Slan by A.E. Van Vaught. Um, Call Me Conrad by Roger Zelazny and uh, Ubik by uh, Philip K. Dick. So Kadarmira is a, a Western science fiction fan, and it, I just I like that I you know sort of bring some of this full circle because of course you know I, I like to reference Frank Herbert, I like to reference Tolkien and all these other writers who have who've been big influences on me. I'm not shy about that, and um, and so I I like to honor my ancestors, as it were. Uh, and so it's kind of neat that Mira is influenced by these old 60s F SF guys, and I can bring some of that back to contemporary SF. You know, like it's you know, like it's an old you know heirloom that's been passed around. Um, but but yes, Berserk was definitely an influence. Um, there's a couple. There's actually a subplot in Book Three that's a reference to it. I'll see if you can catch it. Um, so get back to me on that one, Alex. We will talk. Um, and, oh, I missed the part of Michael's question about doing a Karn youth story. I don't know if I want to do Karn's story where he – the one that Hadrian tells where he fights the uh, the exalted who destroy his planet and uh, and slowly Gormgast style manipulates his way through their crew to take over because you know how that ends. Um, it might be fun to do anyway, and I still might do it. Um, and you already know how Hadrian's story ends, so I'm being a hypocrite. Um, but – We'll see. I might actually, I think the more interesting story might be to do Karn's first regeneration, to borrow a Doctor Who turn of phrase, um, and do that. I, I have a story I've got outlined called Ichiro, which Ichiro is Japanese for first son. There's a reference to Ichiro in, in Howling Dark. His room is still in Karn's uh, laboratory. This is one of those little deep references. If you if you know your Japanese, you'll know that Karn has preserved the bedroom of his first clone child in the garden and Hadrian finds it briefly. Um, so I do kind of want to do that story. Um, let's see. At what point did you realize you were at a safe point with Crispin to write the lesser devil? Um, Oh, it's Andy. Hey, Andy. Andy is my little brother, so he's my Crispin. Actually, Andy likes to point out my other little brother is actually Crispin. I think they're both wrong. Um, I think that Crispin is Thor to Hadrian's Loki. But that's okay. Um, speaking mythologically and perhaps in terms of Marvel Comics. Um, but uh, I don't really know. I wrote The Lesser Devil when I was at Worldcon in California in 2018. I was staying at, um, at, Joe, at my friend Joe's parents' house. Um, and I don't like conventions. I'm not really comfortable in panels. Uh, I obviously like to talk, but I don't like to interrupt people, um, particularly other writers uh, particularly other more established, um, more popular, more beloved writers. And so I don't like panels. Um, I don't, um, I just don't, I just don't like the whole, the whole environment. I, I like going to conventions and working at the booth and talking to you guys, uh, particularly one-to-one -one, answering questions like this and hanging out. I don't like the whole formal structure. So I kind of bailed and I was like, I'm going to write this Crispin story. Cause I was waiting. I had, um, this was, uh, a couple months after Empire Silence came out, uh, I'd already finished Howling Dark because I turned it in before Empire came out. As I was, I was, I was on it. Uh, I have slipped a little bit. Book four, you will notice, is only half done. Um, 
And I wanted to do something because I had months before I was going to get it back from my editor. So I was like, um, Crispin. And so I didn't really have a plan. So I just I sat down and I sketched out a really thin outline because I'd already done all the world building for Delos. Um, I knew that the sort of Catholic reservation was out in the mountains because I needed an explanation for Hadrian to know who Dante and Milton were and to make these references, even though Hadrian's kind of confused about what's real, um, like what how Catholicism works. So he like has all these references, but he doesn't quite get them. Um, so I knew that was all there, and I kind of just plunked a story in there because obviously all the House Oren stuff was already in backstory with their dad. Um, I might do a Crispin 2 Electric Boogaloo. Some people want to do that too. So while we're talking about other spinoff books, I might do at some point. I've got a whole list, guys. Um, I, I swear I haven't forgotten about them. Um, I want to sneak them in between bigger books, but I also want to do bigger books. After book five and Hadrian's story is done, I've got some totally standalone things in this universe I want to do. And eventually I've got a whole fantasy world I've been building I want to do some stuff with. It's, it's literally, it's a whole fantasy world. I've got everything from northern europe to like persia mapped out um and i'm slowly working on that but i might take 10 years to get all that together and do sun eater stories in the meantime um because i authors tend to when they make jumps between genres like that lose a lot of people who just want more of what they've been doing um and so that's a tricky transition so i like being typecast as an actor um so I want to definitely, and I'm not tired of, of the Sun Eater universe at all. I could live there for the rest of my career if I wanted to. But in case you can't tell from the way Sun Eater is written, fantasy is really my first love, um, even o over science fiction. I And I'm writing fantasy in space, but if I could do it actually in like a classical world setting where like I can really lean on my acumen as a, as a history guy, I think that'd be really fun. Um, let's see. Uh, Esteban, Chris, book three is out, baby. Let go. Uh, so my friend and I have had a field day trying to imagine what the Cielsen throne snake weapon is like. I forgot what they're called. Can you describe them? They're called Nachte. Uh, the Nachte, they coil up like whips, um, and they kind of like, will whirl them like lassos and then toss them. And then they kind of home in on heat sources and they've got little drill bits at the front end. Like, you know, this is the best I can do in my hand and they rotate really, really fast. Um, and they drill through whatever they can get through. And the sort of armor that you put on uh, your common Sol and Legionnaire is not proof against that kind of thing. Um, the Sealson use those because uh, shouldn't, you shouldn't be shooting things on a spaceship. You can hit a pipe. You're going to break a window. Everyone's going to die. Guns, spaceships, bad. Um, the human solution was knives and swords. The Sealson, of course, used knives and swords too. But they came up with this evil drone thing. Um I it, it looks uh, kind of almost like a spinal column, frankly, not to be too grotesque. Uh, it's got little segments on it, and then it's got the little drill bitty thing at the end. It uses the same kind of repulsor technology as float pallets and ships, uh, just kind of repels off of um, you, uh, you know, off of the a planet's magnetic field uh, by countering it the same way that. Um, the same way that those other things do. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, second interest, more stories featuring Karn. Yes. Yeah, totally. Uh, we imagine an lateral chainsaw baby snake alien in the water from Prometheus uh, type blow weapon, uh, bio weapon. Yeah, actually, that's about right. Uh, I don't think there are any organic components to the Cielsen uh, uh, Nachte. Uh, they're not really uh, biotech people. Uh they're actually pretty low tech uh, compared to where the humans are. They don't have shields, for instance, um, although that might be changing. Um, let's see. Uh, excellent points about transhumanism. Refreshing take. Thank you, Grant. And I'm glad you're here, man. It was really good talking to you a couple days ago. Grant and I uh, went to school together. Um, Alexander, when you said Hadrian isn't giving us the whole truth, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis in Screwtape Letters when he says, the reader should be advised the devil is a liar. Exactly. All right. Um, I think there is a bit, ironically, where Hadrian says he lies less than people believe. And I think that's right. Because the tendency, like, I, I've seen a lot of reviews. People are like, oh, Hadrian's an unreliable narrator. I'm not 100% sure what Hadrian is lying about. I don't know exactly where he is um, 
totally i don't think he's ever making anything totally up out of out of the blue there are if you read the lesser devil there are some parts where crispin remembers things a little differently and i'm really excited to do more with that as i write other other stories um where like crispin says that hadrian beat the snot out of him like broke his ribs and stuff and hadrian kind of skips over that again probably because he feels bad um or he doesn't know exactly how badly he beat crispin up um uh, Valka and Hadrian would have been awesome uh, on the cover. Uh, yeah, that would have been really cool. So the good news about that, actually, uh, Michael, as far as covers go, is I work for a publishing company, uh, and I do I do these anthologies. I've actually got you can't quite see them. Whoop, wrong way. Uh, the books that Howling Dark is sitting on is an anthology called Cosmic Corsairs that I got coming out actually in just a couple weeks. It's coming out the first week of August, and there is a uh, there's a Sun Eater story in that. It's actually referenced in um, uh, Demon in White when Hadrian meets uh, the the knight captain junior officer on their ship, the guy who watches them while they're all in fugue. Because um, when you're traveling 40 years at a stretch, right, like you need a B team. And so you get a lot of like the, the junior kids of Palatine nobles who go into the military, get these like cushy jobs where their only job is to fly a ship at faster than light speed where they can't really be caught for 40 years and then they retire at the other end. Right. Um, and so he's hung out with them, done a few missions with them a little, stayed a little bit longer because where they're fighting the Sielsen officers are forced to stay in the core and enlisted men are forced to stay in the core much longer. Um, and so it's about him discovering, uh, having to save everybody from pirates because it's a book about space pirates. Right. So he has to fight everyone off. Uh, and he's not really up to the task. Right. Fortunately, a certain uh, Hadrian Marlowe happens to still be awake, and he also gets to meet him. So he gets to see Hadrian from outside his own head in that story. Um, and in doing these anthologies, sorry, tangent, always tangent. Um, I'm doing one that's going to come out next year called Sword and Planet. Um, I think it's going to be summer next year. We don't have a month set down yet because we're still doing that schedule. And Sword and Planet is going to be like, you know, the old John Carter of Mars stories where you've got, it's like, it's fantasy, it's science fiction, peanut butter, chocolate together. Obviously, that's what Sun Eater is. I talked to my boss into letting me do uh, do a collection of stories and get some of my friends who are writers. DJ Butler is going to do a story for me. Uh, Tim Akers has done a story for me. Uh, Simon R. Green is going to do one for that book too. Uh, R. Verdi, LJ Hackmeister. Uh, trying to get some people from uh, my UK publishing family, from Daw, from Bain, some of my indie friends, get them all together, do stories for that. And then I'm going to do a Valka Hadrian story for that. And I think I've convinced my boss to let me hire Kieran to do that Valka Hadrian cover for that anthology. So I think I might have saved it because I really want that picture. Um, between the Deep, the Quiet Brethren, the Murakani, are there plans for other ancient powers? Karin makes mention of more powers in the cosmos at the end of Howling Dark. Justin, what an excellent question. Uh, yes. In fact, I've already mentioned some of them. If you're really paying attention, um, there are other things in the darkness, and they're just as real, and they're even worse. Um, and they will be mentioned, and the Cielsa know about them. And that's all I will say. Um, but I'm very glad you asked. Uh, Alex, I'm a little behind on the stream, but I love that you mentioned Hadrian is guilty in his account. I completely noticed that uh, with Crispin's account of him. It caught me off guard, and I love that. Yeah, Hadrian's made some mistakes, especially when he's a kid. Um, he feels really bad, I think, about how he treated his brother. And if you read Lesser Devil 2, Crispin's not the kid anymore that Hadrian thought he was, right? We all, I think, make some pretty terrible mistakes when we're kids, teenagers, right? And Hadrian feels real bad. Um, and he's never really uh, he's never really gotten over that some of that. And he's done some other things too, right? Obviously, he does the thing. Um, that doesn't mean Hadrian's a bad person. I'm trying to figure out, right? Hank Frank Herbert uh, believes that heroes are bad. Star Wars believes that heroes are good. At least it did until, you know, 2017. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to split the difference between Luke Skywalker and Paul Atreides, and I want to see which way Hadrian ends up. That was sort of my, like, thought experiment that started this whole thing. Once I became a grown-up and realized that's what I wanted to do with the world that I'd built. 
Um, and I say became a grown up, but I make up stuff for a living. So I don't know if I ever got there. Um, let's see, uh, Alex again, uh, Hadrian, from his perspective, I never saw him as this awesome fighter or warrior, even during his fight scenes. It wasn't until the lesser devil, though, through Crispin's eyes, I saw Hadrian as a real warrior. Yeah, uh, Hadrian is no slouch. Um, he sort of downplays it because he's not proud of the fact that he's really good at fighting, especially as a kid. Um, let's see. Um Yo, I uh, love the first book. As a black reader of SFF, do you really think there is a need um, for an improvement finding and facilitating minority writers in the genre? Man, I think that anybody who wants to write science fiction uh, should write science fiction. And I, I don't know why there aren't more. Like maybe it's some bad editors. Uh, you know, maybe there I, – I, I, I don't know. I – We'll tell you this, Magnus. If you're writing and you want to submit to us a Bane, I would be honored to read what you write, man. Um, I don't know. I, I can't speak for the culture as a whole. Um, and but yeah, I, I will read. I'll read just about anything. I um, yeah, that's a that's a tricky one because I I don't know because I, I I've worked I worked the industry for a while now and I can't like I haven't found a racist editor right. Um, and I work for what is ostensibly the most uh, most right wing house there is, right? Uh, I work for Bain Books, and and to level with you, Magnus, like uh, I I haven't I haven't seen a single person at my work um, or at any of the other houses that I've I've hung out with at conventions. Uh, so I I don't know. Um, I don't know if there needs to be some sort of structural change to the way publishing operates uh, or what. Uh, I know that when you submit to agents and to publishers, right, like it doesn't have to come up, right, when you write a query letter. Like I never mentioned I was Italian. Um, and, and so I don't know, man. Um, but like I said, if you got something you want to you wanna query, I'll check it out all day. Um, you send it to us at uh, uh, bain.com slash submit. Uh, we're one of the few publishing houses that just takes stories from writers straight up. You don't need an agent. Uh, be happy to look at it, my man. Uh, let's see. Uh, we need more of Sabine. I loved her in Lesser Devil. Sabine is awesome. Uh, yeah, she is definitely Alistair's real kid. Uh, if I had to pick one of the three, um, I kind of, I really want to see if I can work her into even just a chapter in one of the later books. See, have her meet Hadrian, as I've alluded to her, maybe coming to the Imperial Court in Lesser Devil. We'll see. Uh, Magnus, I respect your background and majored in history, have an MA in medieval Britain, man, you're ahead of me. Uh, I just have a, uh, I have a bachelor's in, uh, in English rhetoric and I minored in classics by accident almost. I mean, like I do a lot of reading on my own, right? You know, education is not just the credential, but I, I wish I could have stayed, but, uh, money wasn't, money wasn't there. Um, uh, yeah, no, write more, pull from the historical background, do it, man. Um. Let's see. We're reaching the end of the questions. Uh, C. Elson Nahute kind of reminded me of the Yuzan Vong Amphistaff from an aesthetic point of view. Man, I didn't even think of that. I got to level with you. Uh, I read just the first Yuzan Vong book, and I didn't like it. I think that was the R.A. Salvatore one. I know I know. Bob Salvatore gets beat up for killing Chewbacca. That wasn't my big problem with that book. Um, I just didn't think the Yuzan Vong belonged in Star Wars. They felt so out of place. And there have been a couple times because I, I make fun of the Yuuzhan Vong all the time with my friends because we're old old school Star Wars fans, right? Which makes hanging out with Timothy Zahn weird, I tell you. Um, Tim's a cool guy, um, but um, but I uh, I make fun of the Yuuzhan Vong all the time. And I'm starting to realize that the Cielsen kind of resemble them in some ways, and I think that's just the H.R. Geiger influence because I'm a huge Alien fan. Huge alien fan. I'm like the one idiot who likes Prometheus. Um, I think Prometheus is like a mess of a movie, but I thought it was cool. And I thought that Michael Fassbender's David was like the best villain in science fiction film for like 20 years. Um, so let's see. Um, fantastic answer on the minority question. Thanks, Magnus. I, it's a weird year, man. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, Talk to you a few, on Twitter a few times. Uh, I'm the one guy who also loves Dio. Yes, Ronnie James Dio is the man. Um, talking about metal again, I, I, man, Ronnie Ronnie James Dio is the best. Uh, I actually bought a bed from his estate sale 
bought his guest room bed, and that's the the bed we use. Uh, uh, so now I'm a huge Dio fan. He's just he's probably the best metal vocalist of all time. At least the most, maybe the best and most influential, right? Because like Halford's awesome, uh, you know. So it's hard to tell. I'm a huge John Oliva fan too. Uh, anyway, I could talk about metal all day. That's probably a different stream though. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, Joe. Uh, I'll give you one last question. If you could start over, uh, what's something you would change with the series? Um, plot wise, I don't know. Um, but in terms of execution, I think that the Delos stuff at the beginning of Empire of Silence could use another editorial pass. It's maybe not something that an author should admit, but it's an interesting story. Um, Empire of Silence mostly got rewritten after it was bought by the publisher. My editor uh, was like, I loved it. I read it in one night. Um, I just want you to change these two things. And I looked at what they were, and I was like, Sarah, if I do this, I got to like rewrite the whole thing. She's like, well, no, just everything after he leaves home. Um, and um, so I rewrote everything after he gets on Dimitri's ship and leaves Delos. And I did that in about three months, and it about cost me my sanity. I could hardly speak by the end of it because I was trapped in my house uh, by myself for several months, which is an experience we're all too familiar with now. And um, so when I finished Empire of Silence, everything from before he leaves home is about three years older than everything from after that. And there's three years of me progressing as a writer in that window – and I don't think that what came before in the Delo section is bad by any means. Um, but I do think that it could uh, – I think that it could use a little uh, a little more polish maybe. Or I think maybe that I'm capable of more now, and I would like to rewrite that. Um, let's see. Uh, I wasn't in love with them at first, but I came to enjoy the series. Michael, are you talking about the Yuzan Vong? Um, you'd know better than me. Like I said, I only read the first one. Um, I'm not a, actually a huge Star Wars Expanded Universe guy, even though I am like an old EU fan. Um, I mostly it was I, I mean, basically, I'm a, I'm a Star Wars movie guy. Fundamentally, I'm, I love Star Wars, the first real science fiction thing I ever got into. Um, and I read a lot of the books. I read a lot of like the young, like young readers books. Those are some of the first books I read. And I think Heir to the Empire was the first book I ever bought for myself. Thrawn stuff's great, obviously. Um, but uh, I never really got into all the, the deep stuff after that. Uh, Esteban, thank you, Chris. Uh, fantasy, are you a Malazan fan? Oh, talking about maybe writing fantasy. Um, yeah, I want to someday. Uh, but I have actually not read Malazan yet. Um, I know Erickson's also a big ancient history guy, so I've been, I've been meaning to read it. I have Gardens of the Moon on my Audible account. But there's something about like the ten volume giant series, and I know I'm writing a five volume giant series, but like Wheel of Time, for instance, it's what seventeen books. That's like two, three years of my life, right? Um, I'm a little nervous about getting into something that's that big. So I have not taken the plunge on Malazan, but I would like to. Um, couldn't be more hype. You got a fantasy series in the works, killing the game, please stay <laughs> one day. Um, like I said, the, the I want to take a long time sort of figuring out the um, the fantasy universe. I do have one story in it, or two stories in it, already worked out that I, I, I could do, like, as books immediately after Hadrian. Um, you know. Uh, but I don't know if I'm going to do that yet, just because I'm worried that if I finish Hadrian and then leave the universe, that people will freak out and be like, oh, he's done. Um, so I want to make sure after Hadrian that I let you Sun Eater fans know I'm not done with the Solon Empire, not by any stretch. There's another whole big series, actually. It's probably one of those big 10-volume series that I would like to do in that universe at some point. It's set after Hadrian, not before, so it's not the Marikani. Um, But we'll see if we get there. Uh, I want to do uh, – I'm supposed to have kids at some point. Uh, Jenna and I are talking about trying to figure out what I'm going to write around that. So I might do some shorter stuff you know, before – before we get into that. Um, but it looks like we reached the uh, we reached the bottom of the questions. I'll hang out for just a second in case anyone wants to ask a couple more. But we're at about the two-hour mark anyway. Uh, so that seems like, a, like about the right plan. Um, so I do want to say 
a couple things here at the end. And I'll, I'll while I do this, you know, if you got an extra couple questions, we'll say we'll take two if two come in. Um, uh, I, I want to, of course, first thank everyone who's still here. I know some folks left earlier. If they come back later, I was really glad that you all were here. I was afraid it'd be just me and me and Joe and Marcus and you know my mom hanging out. Um, and I saw a couple other names that I, you know, I recognize friends. Thanks for spending your evening with me. It really means a lot. And for those of you, you know, who I don't know personally or just readers, uh, you know, uh, just readers, right? No one's just a reader. I'm really grateful uh, that you all enjoy the books and that you spent the time hanging out. Uh, you know, a couple off the top of my head, you know, Magnus Esteban here right at the, at the bottom, I, everybody. Um, you know, I am really, really just happy that, Anybody is enjoying the books. It's really, it's still a surreal experience. I don't, uh, I don't know what to do with that. So I just want you all to know how grateful I really am. Personally, I like to do that every, every time a new one comes out. Just make sure I say that. Um, I uh, just want to remind everyone, if you do want to get a signed book, the link to that's going to be in the description. Just uh, when you check out under other comments, eventually you want it signed and how you want it signed. And I'll take care of those tomorrow. First thing in the morning before I go to the office, I'm going to the store to sign everything. And uh, there is also a um, uh, let's ooh, hang on a couple questions. Let's see. Uh, thanks for fascinating universe. I have no deep insights or worthwhile critiques. I'm just a guy who really enjoys the world you built and the story you're telling. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, it really does mean a lot. And one more. I'm brand new to your books. The link at the bottom doesn't have book two and three in mass market available. Uh, where is the next best place to buy them? Is most advantageous to you? Um, it's weird. I think maybe possibly book two might be on the second page in mass market. Um, it might be. I'll double check. It just came out, so it's possible Quail Ridge has not updated their listing. Um, book three is not out in mass market just yet. It just came out on hardcover today. Usually the way traditional publishing works these days, they kind of go through phases, is they'll put out whatever the big format is for about a year, be that hardcover or trade paperback, so they can try to make their money at the premium price early when that's the only option. And then they'll put out the mass market about a year in. So book three is not going to be out just yet in paperback. As far as most advantageous, uh, I get paid the same. Authors get paid the same basically wherever you go. If you want to go to Amazon, totally understand. If you're one of those people who won't go to Amazon because uh, you want to support bookstores, you know, Barnes & Noble is great. Books a Million is great. I hear they're still out there somewhere. Um, you know, um, your local indie bookstore, whichever one's nearest to you, wherever your favorite place to buy books, totally uh, going to be the same. The publisher and the author always get the same percentage of the retail price. The difference, like Amazon – for instance, is selling it, I think, like 10 bucks off right now because it's new. Um, Amazon is losing money on every one of those books that it sells because it's making all of its money back on Prime subscriptions and, uh, and, and Kindle Unlimited deals and stuff like that. Um, so they can afford to lose money on items. Um, Barnes & Noble can't afford to do that. Right. So um, Amazon's happy to eat the, eat the discount, but it's always the retailer who eats the discount. So go ahead and, and get it from wherever is best for you. Um, the last thing I did allude to a, uh, a surprise. It's not the secret project I've been talking about. I'm still not allowed to tell anybody what the secret project is. I will, in fact, be murdered if I do. Um, so that'll come hopefully soon. The pandemic uh, kind of froze that in its tracks for several months. Uh, fingers crossed by the end of the year, we'll be able to be able to get into it. Um, but uh, let's see the surprise. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked two hours. My brain's starting to go a little fuzzy. Uh, there is a film composer named Will Musser. Musser. Oh, gosh, Will, I forgot how to say your name. Please forgive me. Will Musser. Um, who did some stuff for Game of Thrones. He did some stuff for American Horror Story. He scored uh, Gretel and Hansel, that horror movie uh, from a uh, I think beginning of this year and he scored uh, Samson, that sort of like Conan looking version of the old Testament story. And, um, and uh, he emailed me and said he was a big fan and that he uh, would trade me if I signed a copy of empire of silence. He would write me a piece of music and he just got the empire of silence piece of music into me uh, yesterday. He did it a, a quick little symphonic piece a uh, Hadrian sort of theme song called it. Uh, I shall go on alone after the last line in the books. Um, and so as soon as this is over, I'm going to go make that video public right here on the channel. Uh, you can listen to his little piece uh, in honor of Hadrian. Uh, apparently if I send him book two, he's going to do another one. So 
That's very exciting. It's the first piece, first piece of fan art that I've gotten is a classical music piece, which is awesome. Uh, so you should go check that out. Uh, give me five minutes to make that public, and then we'll we'll get everything square. Everybody, uh, thank you again. Uh, Heather just ordered a copy. Thank you, uh, Artful Stories. Thank you, too. Uh, sorry for the long-winded, rambly answer about how bookstores work. Um, I talk too much. And Magnus, oh, another one from the South. Awesome. Yeah, we got to stick together, man. Uh, keep, people keep making fun of Southerners uh, of all stripes. You know, They're like, oh, we don't have food down here. Yes, we do. All right, everybody. On that note, I'm going to go post the, the song right now. Thank you all for being here. It has been an absolute pleasure and it is an honor to write for you. Uh, I am going to get back to work on book four real soon. For those of you uh, who uh, who haven't seen my little update, it's about 40% done. I think by October, November, I'll be done with book four. And I'm going to sneak some short stories in. I do have a short story coming out next month, and I got another two, I think, coming out this year that are already finished. So more updates on that. If you want to stay updated, uh, go to stalinempire.com. There's a, a link there to sign up for the newsletter. Um, or you can hit like on this video as every YouTuber in the universe says and subscribe right here. Cause I'm going to try and keep everyone posted this way. Not a lot of authors do YouTube. So I think maybe this will help me stand out. All right. You all stay well. Uh, I'll talk to you soon.